of course, you have to think we are not alone. We, we have to live with these animals around. And it's really interesting to see a, a deer crossing the, the street. And uh, why not a black bear? Hey guys, Eric Olson here, and welcome to episode 23 of the Science Centric Podcast. This episode is all about bears, one of my favorite fur covered creatures. Our guide on this earth sign journey is Remy Marion, author, photographer, and documentary filmmaker who has devoted his life to observing bears in the wild since the 1980s. Remy is a member of France's National Society of Geographers and Explorers and an authority on the biggest bears, brown bears and polar bears. His book on being a bear face to face with our wild sibling was recently translated into English and is set for release in the US at the end of this month. The book delves into humanity's two million year old love hate relationship with bears, covers all the latest science on these fascinating creatures and includes accounts of Remy's up close and personal encounters with bears, perhaps a little too up close and personal. If you love bears, you're gonna love this book. But before we dive into our conversation with Remy, a few quick reminders. One, if you wanna see more content like this, be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Two, find out how you can support our work directly by going to sciencecentric.com support for more info or check out the links in the description below. And now let's jump into the conversation about bears. So Remy, thank you so much for coming on the Science Centric Podcast. It's so awesome to have you here and um, uh, welcome. Thank you, Eric, it's a pleasure. <laughs> um, so you you are the bear the bear expert um, you, you've, you've studied bears, you've, you've been around them, you've made films about them, uh, you now have a book, uh, you, you've written a book about them, uh, which we can talk about. Um, and um, I guess my first question to you is, is how did you get interested in bears? Uh, what, what drew you to them and, and why this sort of lifelong um, interest in them? So uh, my first trip uh, was in uh, 1986 in, uh, in Spitzbergen, so in Northern Europe, uh, with a group of uh, specialists of birds. And uh, with my wife who discovered this part of uh, the world, and it was uh, like, a, you know, like, a, you know, like an accident, you know, you're not, like with your car, if you knock something very far. And, um, and uh, of course, it was a, a great beginning for us. And, uh, and uh, when we come back and uh, I start to study the, the seals and the fur seals. Mm. And at that time, it was not possible to find a, um, a guide with all the species of seals and fur seals in the world. And so I start to write something and I found a, a publisher in France and it was my first book in 1993, okay. uh, long time ago. Yeah. Uh, but of course, if you are interested by seals, of course, at what time you, you find the polar bear on the way. Uh, on the track, <laughs> of course. And uh, I start my first trip um, in uh, in Churchill area in uh, Manitoba, Canada, uh, in 1990. And uh, it was a very special time because it was really uh, the beginning uh, of the of the tourism and the observation in uh, in Churchill area. Now we have many many people, but maybe too many. But it yeah. was like the beginning. And uh, after for 25 years. <laughs> I spent the autumn and a part of the winter in Churchill uh, wow. for polar bears. Uh, so that's been a lot of time in the polar bears country, uh, more than two years uh, in the Churchill area. Uh, but during that time, I wrote some more books. I traveled in other places in the Arctic, and uh, I discovered the brown bears, uh, and especially um, in uh, Siberia uh, and Kamchatka. And uh, and sometimes in Alaska, but a lot of time in Kamchatka, where yeah. you have uh, many many bears, brown bears fishing uh, salmon, and um, it was very exciting to discover all these uh, bears. And at that time, in, for polar bears, it was not on the magazine polar bears. It was not uh, you know like a, a star uh, for the global warming and everything. Yeah. And uh, okay, I see. I will be the specialist of polar bear in France. <laughs> okay, like that. There are nobody, so that's me. <laughs> and 
uh, okay. And uh, after I, I work a lot for many channels, uh, for a very important uh, uh, magazine. It uh, was uh, Ushuaia in France, very mm -hmm. important. And um, so many things like that. So it was a, a beginning of new career for me. Yeah. So, so before you got into bears and writing about bears and filming them and photographing them, did you have a background in science or uh, or were you were you just uh, kind of a self-taught naturalist? How did how did you? Um... Yeah, I I am a self-made man for naturalists and uh, bears, um, but I, I am a little bit scientist because I am chemist and uh, ah. I work at the time in the industry. And but of course uh, I changed all my life uh, and uh, to 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 spend a maximum of time on the on the fields and with bears and. I travel a lot of time in the south, also in Antarctica, uh, in the Falkland Islands, uh, everywhere in the world. Yeah. Well, that that sounds way more exciting than than mixing up uh, reagents That's and right. things like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, I'm a bit je I'm a bit jealous. I, I I know you've traveled a lot, and that's it sounds very exciting. Um, so so uh, but when you when you got interested in polar bears, you said that they weren't as sort of maybe well-known as they are now or iconic as they are now. Um, I think people probably would be much more likely to encounter brown bears, for example, or black bears than, than polar bears um, because because yeah. polar bears are so specific. I mean, they, they have such a specific lifestyle, right? Yeah, um, that's right. And, and also uh, because the polar bear, you know, nobody would want to destroy the polar bear. In some place in the world, some people would want to destroy the brown bear, for example, in France or in some part of the world, maybe near Yellowstone in the U.S., you have some people who would want to kill uh, more grizzlies. And, uh, but for the polar bears, nobody would want to destroy the species. There mm -hmm. are some hunters in the north, of course, but all the people like polar bears because the polar bear is a very special animal, very elegant uh, Yeah. Very impressive, and it's maybe the most important things for me. Uh, the the polar bear is like a dancer for me. He's like a dancer when he's moving on the sea ice. He's like that, you know. It's a very very soft touch with the snow, and you know I like this animal for that also. And it's not only because it's uh, iconic animals. It's also it's because it's a very elegant, a very powerful animal, and very uh, uh, soft when he's moving. And, Sometimes, of course, he's, he's moving faster, and he, but usually a polar bear is very quiet anymore, very, very quiet. You mentioned something interesting in the book about the speed at which polar bears move. Um, could you explain that? They're, they're, they're sort of locked into a particular speed and gait at which they move, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. And the studies was in, uh, in the Museum of uh, Natural History Museum in Paris. And uh, yes, because the, the bears, it's like a, a thermos bottle. And he has to move very, uh, um, you know, just always at the same speed, four kilometers uh, usually. And it's a good speed for him. For, yes, for him, you know, it's like a human for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for him. And so it's moving always at four kilometers, and that's a good speed for him. And uh, if, you, if he has to move uh, to go run, for example, that means the temperatures increase very fast. Mm. And at 42 degrees Celsius, he has to stop, like a human, you know, it's uh, the maximum. And it's why the hunters, for example, the Inuit hunters, and push the bears with, uh, with dogs. And uh, after two kilometers, for example, the bears has to stop. Oh, and wow. They can keep. Okay. And it's very easy in this case. Uh, so, because it's a problem of thermal thermo regulation, and um, he has a very important uh, pelt, fur, of course, yeah. uh, but also grease under the pelt, and uh, he has to move, but uh, very, uh, very, uh, you know, very slow, slowly. And if you are, if you've seen a movie, a bear, a polar bear running, it's not good. That means you have an helicopter not far, you have a plane, you have a drone, uh -huh. uh, you have a zodiac not far. Uh, and it's not normal to see a polar bear running. So, so they're so they're so well insulated that if they're if they're running too fast, they just overheat. So, we have this impression of polar bears being these very fierce, like 
you know, predators and kind of indestructible and something we should be scared of. But really, if you just make them run a little fat faster than they normally go, they'll like overheat and, and, and pass out or something. Is that yeah. right? Wow. So it's very interesting. For example, in Churchill, uh, of course, you have to push the bears outside the town because sometimes you have bears inside the town. And a, a small dog like that can push a big bear of uh, 400 kilos. Wow. Uh, because a bear, and especially a polar bear, is a very uh, pragmatic, you know, very pragmatic animal. Mm -hmm. uh, he has something very special, he don't know that, or a special noise. He has to, oh, okay, I go away, it's too dangerous for me. And a small dog like that, it's not normal for, uh, for the polar bear. <laughs> uh, especially if it's barking, or so he has to move. And uh, it's why... You, of course, it's a very uh, a dangerous animal for a human. Of course, it's a predator. And sometimes yeah. you have very hard accidents in the north. And usually it's uh, the fault of the human. Because, of course, if you uh, kill a seal and if you open the seal in front of your uh, tent, uh, of course, you attract bears and it's a good, it's a good place to, for an accident. And usually it's a problem uh, of human, not from, from bear. Right, and, right. Uh, it's why it's ever interesting to see the bear moving and how a bear can move and check. And they are very, very, uh, um, they take a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of time because uh, to, to check something. And uh, in Churchill, sometimes at night, I, we spend the night outside with my wife in a car, sometimes to, to see bears in town, in the, in the streets. Huh? And uh, just a small noise with the key and the bear is running. Because, you know, it's always, you know, churching and it needs quiet. Uh, so it's very interesting the, to see the bears in this case, yes. Yeah. So and you, uh, so when, when you were up, uh, you know, documenting these bears, did you, like, what sort of precautions would you take? Um, I, I've seen videos where people put, you know, electric fences around their camps and things like that. I mean... Were, were you were you scared for uh, you know were you ever fearful f that that bears would you know in come into your camp and I mean they are depends they are of the place depends yeah it depends of the place and depends of the bears if it's brown bears black bears and polar bear because mm -hmm. the polar bear it's really a predator and of course it's uh, difficult but if it if it's not possible for the bears to think it's possible because it's, it's too noisy you have dogs. And you know, we stay away, far away. You yeah. know, it's not for me. And but it's very quiet, and you have maybe a, a, f a smell, good smell, and uh, food around. Okay, maybe I can try something. Yeah. Uh, and it's why always a problem with the polar bear. It's a predator, and if he can think, I can try. He will try. Uh, if he'll try one time. Uh, it's very, very bad because that's, uh, you know, you are too close for an accident. I remember in Labrador, in uh, northeast of uh, Labrador, it was not possible for us to have a gun because it's a national park. Uh -huh. And you have only uh, flares. Or, and um, it was very, very close with a young bear, not afraid. And we have to, to, to shoot with the flares. And one time he put the paw on the flares and it was very, very hot. So at the time we moved, but before I come, so very fast. Yeah. So, uh, but it was not possible to use a gun in this time. But in other place, like in Kapchatka, uh, you have many, many bears around. In brown bears, you have, uh, in, the, in one day you can see maybe 50 bears uh, and you are in the middle of the bear. And yeah. in this case, we use a uh, warden, a uh, Russian warden with a, with a gun. And uh, you have no choice because when you have the the eyes in the camera, it's not possible to see round oh, and yeah. to see bear. And and those uh, and polar bears are um, they they sort of uh, stalk you from the side, right? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Is that that's how they attack their prey normally? Is they cut they don't come straight yeah. on? It's always from the side, right? In another place for a movie, uh, we were with my wife in the northern Alaska in a place uh, named uh, Kaktovik. And in this place, uh, Inuit can uh, hunt uh, whales, uh, right whale. And of course, they leave, uh, you know, the carcass on the beach and that attract many, many polar bears. 
but we were there to see grizzly and polar bears in the same frame. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the uh, that's best place for that. So, but it's at night. So that means you are outside at night in the fog uh, with sometimes 15 bears, polar bears around. During the night, it's dark, absolutely dark. And uh, a polar bear at night is like a, a ghost. Uh, so it's very, very difficult to see a polar bear at night. Eh? Yeah, so yeah, he's yeah. moving. Uh, and you know, in the fur, it's not very easy to see the, the body of the, the animal. And sometimes you have to run to, to the car because the bear was uh, maybe 15 meters. Wow, that's terrifying. Too close. <laughs> too close. <laughs> that's way too close. <laughs> <laughs> and these are big animals, right? I mean, they're what? What is a what is a polar bear weigh? A uh, male polar bear. Depends of the of the sex. If it's a female, adult female, it's uh, around two hundred fifty kilos. Which is what? What's that in pounds? I'm just uh, five hundred pounds, something okay. like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. For a female, a little bit more. Uh, depends of the the season. Uh, uh, and for a big male, uh, maybe uh, twelve years old. In the you know when he's the biggest, he can go to. Uh, 900 pounds, 1,000 pounds. Yeah. Uh, and it's very, very impressive. It's yeah. a very, very big animal. <laughs> I can't, I can't imagine like actually standing next to an animal, you know, close to an animal like that. You know, that sounds big when you say it as a number, but I bet when you're actually there in person, that feels a lot bigger than what you know yeah. your sort of rational mind knows. I mean, it's like probably you probably have a real visceral reaction to being an, around an animal that big yeah but w w with polar bears like that we stay very far away usually uh, because okay. if, you are, you, if we are close it's quite dangerous because it's impossible to shoot and to stop the bear with one shoot uh, and it's we are not here for that uh, I say all, all my life to say if we have to shoot a polar bear it's finished for me I stop mm. my uh, activity. Uh, we are not for that. We're here to to, to take some good shots and uh, to be, uh, you know, a, a witness. But that's it. No more. We are not here for hunt. Uh, right. So for us, it. So that's okay. Now I touch wood, and uh, no, no problem for that. <laughs> um, something you uh, brought up in the book, I thought was interesting about polar bears, is you is is you seem to think that. Uh, at least for the time being, um, now your book was first written in 2017, but, uh, published in 2017, but you seem to think polar bears are, are doing okay. Um, there's still quite yeah. a few of them yeah. and, 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 you know, that's kind of different than what we typically hear in the media that, you know, they're, they've come become this icon of, of climate change. And, and, you know, there's that image of the polar bear on the, on the sea ice and there's nothing, you know, like one little piece of sea ice and there's no ice around him. Um, but but you you sort of you sort of take issue with that having seen yeah I like your, yeah I like your question uh, Eric because it's one of my favorite uh, action in France and uh, especially against uh, zoo uh, because uh, a lot of people uh, are interested by the pro climate uh, change and the polar bear problem uh, now if you check the population. The population, the estimated population of polar bears in 27,000 animals in the in the Arctic, maybe a little bit more. And so that means you have 19 different population, and some are decreasing, uh, like uh, Beaufort Sea, for, for example, in northern Alaska, mm -hmm. or Barents Sea in Spitsbergen. But uh, some, and a, a big group in the northern Canada, the population are stable or maybe increasing. And so that means it's difficult to speaking about uh, polar bears only in the general Arctic, in some place. Of course, it's uh, uh, quite difficult, uh, but usually it's not a problem. So it's easy to pick to pick up one slide, one picture or a big, a small seconds of polar bear on a small, small piece of ice and you put that on the media, and uh, you can say, give me uh, 500, uh, $550, uh, and I will save the polar bear. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, for example, in the zoo, 
And um, it's a big problem because they would want to have a small uh, polar bear cups because, uh, you know, it's like a, a body marshal, you know, you receive money all the time. <laughs> and, and it's not to, to, for the preservation, it's not for to save the species. Yeah. And it's a very, very big problem because it's a very big problem of communication. I yeah. wrote another book in French. It's the uh, geopolitic of polar bear. Ah, because okay. polar bear, it's really, a really interesting animal for that, for the relationship between the different countries, and also the manipulation. You know, uh, how uh, uh, organizations who can use the polar bear uh, to take some money, and it's uh, it's a pity, really. Yeah. Um, do you think though that if uh you know, things go the way they are, that, that the pack ice continues to shrink. Um, do you think that, that polar, bear, polar bears will face some problems in the future um, with their hunting? Yes. I, yeah. Yes, of course. But the most important time for, for you have to see the sea ice. The sea ice uh, uh, melt in the uh, end of June, beginning of July, and the polar bears have to go on the land during the summer. It's normal cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they leave the sea ice, they spend the summer. It's a fasting time for polar bears. It's normal time, fasting time during the summer because you have no sea ice. Of course, when you have the frozen time of the sea ice, the middle of November, for example, uh, beginning of November, they have to go hunting, of course. And of course, the most important thing is how long will be the fasting time. It's not the, the, the sickness of the, the sea ice the big problem. If the melting is uh, very early in the season or uh, the frozen time, it's uh, very late in the season. So that means the fasting time, it's more and more long. Yeah. And uh, uh, that means it's not four months. It's uh, maybe four months and a half or five months. And uh, they need, and especially the female, need a lot of uh, reserve because they don't go on the sea ice in November they mate in uh, June with a male, and after in October, they go in the den for the female only. Uh -huh. They go in the den and give birth in December and go back on the sea ice in March. So that means they have to spend eight months without eating. Wow, yeah. That's the longest fast, uh, fasting time for mammals in the world. And of course, this time of summer without ice, it's very, very important. It's not the sickness of the of the sea ice. You yeah. know, a polar bears can move on, on the sea ice with only five centimeters. It's not a problem for that. Wow. wow. Um, yeah. So I mean, I know it. So so the males don't hibernate uh, essentially, no. and just the females. And so they they have to they but they have to be able to you know uh build up uh stores of fat and things to survive for that for 8 months i mean that's crazy that they can even do that right i mean so does does the sort of decline in 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 sea ice that doesn't impact them at all in terms of storing up enough fat to to make it through that time period or yes. anything like that you can see you can see in some place like in Churchill area where it's very simple to to study bears and now it's unusual to see uh, a female with three cups. Usually it's now it's two cups only. Mm. Um, but they don't hibernate for eight months. Huh? They don't eat for eight months. They hibernate from uh, November to uh, February, something like that. Okay. So polar bear females hibernate, but this is also something that uh, brown bears do a lot of and are kind of known for. Um, and, and black bears also, I mean, do, do yeah. all, so, so one thing that was interesting reading your book, let me just back up for a minute was, um, which I didn't know, but there's only eight bear species in the whole world. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Okay. That's right. Yes. Yeah. That, that's interesting. I, I had no idea. I thought there was probably more that I, you know, I didn't know about, but, um, uh, so out of those eight, do do all of them hibernate, or is this just a thing with um, with no, brown bears? Okay. You know, it depends of the um, if you have food all around the year. For example, for the brown bears during the winter in the forest, uh, you have no food. You have uh, uh, three meters of snow and uh, nothing to eat. Uh, 
and it's why the, the brown bears spend the night, uh, spend the winter in the den. And uh, for the polar bears, they spend the, the, the winter on the sea ice because it's a good time for hunting. Uh, only the females see in the den. Yeah. And for example, for the sun bear, the sun bear, it's a very small bear eating uh, fruits in uh, Malaysia. And he is not, don't he burn it because he has, he has fruit all the time, all around the year. You know, it depends on the food. And, and for the panda, for example, it's quite close. You have uh, bamboo all the time. Right. So, so the closer they are kind of to the equator, there's probably less chance they're going to be hibernating, right? I mean. Yeah, that's right. Depends, depends on the food. And uh, for example, the, the spectacle bears who live in uh, Peru and uh, Venezuela and the uh, Andean, um, yeah, they spend, you know, maybe during the winter, he's not moving a lot, he's, uh, you know, uh, quiet, but uh, don't spend a lot of time in the den, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. like brown bears who spend uh, six months in the den, because during six months, there are nothing to eat. And um, so it's why it's a very, very interesting subject. I made a movie about that, about mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the, the denning time, because some people are uh, a victim in Scandinavia, and with uh, French people also, and uh, French researcher and uh, English, and uh, everywhere in the world, to this uh, hibernation. Because a brown bear can stay six months without moving, without eating. Yeah. And uh, outside, when you go outside in uh, April, uh, no problem. <laughs> and if you spend one month in the bed, in a bed, because you are, you have the COVID, for example, and um, you spend one month, you lost your your uh, muscle uh, mass, your muscle, uh, your your bone mass, and uh, and yeah, it's not possible for you to move or to run or something like that. So a brown bear spends six months without eating, without moving, and it's going outside, no problem. Yeah. So of course it's very interesting because if we can find what is the you know the mechanism for that, that will be possible. For example, to send people to Marsh, you know, to <laughs> very far away, to spend six months, you know, between. <laughs> Earth and March, and uh, if we can put, uh, you know, a good, uh, uh, maybe a bear sample, <laughs> <laughs> bear <blood. laughs> and um, uh, so it's very, very interesting. And now yeah. there are a lot of research about that, a lot yeah. of research, very important research. Yeah. So what are, what are some of the other physiological changes that that bears undergo as they as they settle down for uh, hibernation? Um, you know, they eat a lot, really a lot, uh, during the summer, mm -hmm. and it was not pos It's not possible for a human to eat uh, maybe uh, forty kilos of berries during a day, <laughs> or uh, uh, seventy kilos of salmon in a day. Uh, so of course that would be not possible. And and but for a bear it's not a problem. And of course after they have a lot of, they are very big, they are fat, they are so fat, and it's incredible to see a. Uh, the same bear in spring and the same bear in autumn because you know, it's a double. Yeah. Really, it's a double. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. after that, he can spend this, uh, the six months without eating. But of course, it's a, you no. Know, he has to uh, to start. It's a very special time at the end of the autumn, preparing the hibernation. They eat a uh, few things and sometimes they eat um, the. The, the, the ground around the den to modify the the microbiote microbiote uh yeah mi know, mi cut. microbiome i think is what we yeah, typically that's call right. it yeah, yeah yeah and and they modified you know in the gut and eating the, some ground around and it's possible to see if you study if you and uh, make analysis to, to see it's a uh, so that's the beginning of the hibernation. At that time, the temperature decreases a little bit, only three degrees to uh, 35, and they can spend six months without moving. But they can go outside, yeah. especially during the winter in Europe uh, and also in the northern America. I've seen bears outside the den during the, the winter because sometimes it's uh, warmer. Mm -hmm. With the global warming, sometimes you have a very... Uh, low temperature and for two weeks you have a very uh, warm temperature and for the bears it's not a problem they go outside and they move maybe they try to find something to eat and they go back in the den yeah so so, you know, it, so um okay yeah sorry go ahead so it's quite very different like a squirrel for example 
If, if it's a squirrel, you burn it, you can take the squirrel in your hand and move it. Because uh, the temperature is very low and the earth rate is very low, uh, only uh, maybe eight by minute, but for a bear, it's 20, 25 by minute during yeah. the hibernation. Yeah. So if you make like that outside, if you make a noise, for example, sometimes you can see the head of the bear. Yeah. It's so not, so they're not they're not they're not like in a they're not asleep or they're not like I think when people think of about hibernation they're thinking they're these bears are kind of comatose like you could poke them with a stick and they wouldn't wake up or um you know, they, 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 you know it's lethargy lethargy I say I don't know if it's a good word in, in English but you know they are very slow and they, they of oh, course they, yeah Leth they lethargy, lethargy yeah 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 for example, in um, for polar bears, they use around 500 grams of fat per day. That's it. You know, yeah. it's like a, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. It's a very special time. A very, uh, but of course, they need. We need a lot of studies, and it's not easy to study bears because yeah. we have to catch the same bear in summer or in winter. And uh, to see, you know, to take samples of blood, of uh, grease, uh, different things on the bear, and, but also on, on the same bear. So it's why in Sweden, uh, they have some uh, brown bears uh, with a collar around, radio collar, and they can catch the same uh, bears only one time in the life of the bear, one time in summer, one time in winter. Ah, oh, okay. Interesting. Um, so... Uh... There, you know, there's really only two big uh, bear species, which are the polar bear and the grizzly, and they're they're pretty closely related. But uh, at various times in history, there's been other kinds of bears: cave bears, short-faced mm -hmm. bears. It's kind of this whole family, and we're kind of left with these two, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then and then some other little pockets of you mentioned. Um, I think the bear in South America is is related to the short-faced bears. Um, do do we have any idea why why we why the why the grizzly bear and the polar bear are are kind of well, especially the the brown bears, why they've sort of done so well, um, and maybe these other species didn't. You know, it's very interesting because, of course, in Northern America, you are speaking about grizzly bears, and you see in your mind a very big animal like a polar bear. Mm -hmm. But a brown bear is very interesting because you have very big brown bears in Northern America because the grizzlies have a lot of food. Salmon, or in some place like Yellowstone, they eat uh, elk, uh, wapitis, or something like that. But in Europe, you have the same species. Brown bears also in Pyrenees, for example, or in the South Sweden, in Italy, uh, in, in Spain. But they are very small. But that's the same species. Maybe a big male, it's around 200 kilos, 250 kilos maximum. It's not 500 kilos like a grizzly, but that's the same species. Mm -hmm. Because the brown bears, it's a very, very opportunistic animal. They can eat uh, bees, roots, leaves, fruits. Everything, especially a lot of vegetables, uh, especially in Europe or in Siberia. And um, depends on the place where you see the, the brown bear. Because sometimes also you have the color. In some place you have a very dark brown bear. In some place you have very uh, yellow brown bear. And it's, it's very, very interesting to see the brown bears because you have very different animals and with different personality too. And so it's very interesting to see polar bears, uh, brown bears. If you see polar bears, you have only one type of polar bear. Mm. So it's very different for that. And you have the big male when he's adult and you have female. Two sizes different, female to around 280 kilos, 500 pounds, and the male 1,000 pounds. That, that's it. You have not a lot of difference like the brown bears because uh, polar bears eat only now maybe not, but uh, uh, seals mm -hmm. and uh, uh, polar bears need 55 seals per, per year. Uh, that's it. And during the summer, they can eat some berries, some eggs, and uh, but uh, that's it. Especially they eat seals, 
and uh, sometimes uh, belugas or uh, but they eat meat but brown bears can eat everything yeah. if you open the the, the, the teeth, if you see the teeth of a brown bear, it's like a boar. Really, it's very close to, to, to the, the teeth of a boar. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so do you think that's do you think that's why they've been so successful? Uh, brown bears in particular is there is there just they're like us? They can eat you know just about anything. I, I think so, yes, it's very important because they can eat everything. And if the climate change, for example, it was uh, in the. During the last glaci glaciation, it was possible to see a cave bear in France, in the south part of France, and they eat only uh, vegetables. Uh, <laughs> that's it. Uh, uh, no animals or very few. And um, yes, it's it's why it's possible to see brown bears from. Uh, and now you can see brown bears in the uh, Northwest Territories in Canada, and they eat uh, sometimes uh, muskox or uh, very big animals. And in yeah. some places, you have a special behavior, you know, like a, you know, a special culture for the, like uh, you have uh, you have brown bears eating only salmon in some place. But it's unusual, of course, uh, to see uh, uh, brown bears fishing in France. It's not possible. But yeah. maybe some years ago, maybe uh, 15 years ago, brown bears also fish in France. We don't know. Right, right. Yeah, so they're, yeah, and, and they... Um... I mean, it's, it's interesting to me too, that, I mean, so bears are, bears are big. I mean, they're big animals, but they've been so successful and they've sort of, you know, there's been a lot of other large carnivores and, uh, her herbivores for that matter, that sort of succumb to human populations. Uh, it's the, what they call the overkill hypothesis that, you know, 15 to 20,000 years ago, especially in North America, um, all these all these animals kind of went the went the way of the dodo so to speak because of of uh human activity but but why do you think bears uh you know bears wolves mountain lions i mean those are the only big carnivores i can think of why did they survive and and sort of escape from that yeah i think it's it's not only uh one reason it's not only the human hunting uh, mm -hmm. It's also the climate change at that time, after the, especially after the, the glaciation, uh, many uh, species disappear. Um, my last book, uh, not published in English yet, uh, but it is uh, uh, about the muskox, for example. Uh -huh. And uh, it's also a very interesting example because the muskox live in the south part of France, uh, 400,000 years, uh, and uh, now is living just uh, very far in the north. And um, so it's very interesting to see which type of animals can live. But um, of course, the, the brown bears, it's very opportunistic. So if the, if the human destroy a part, maybe the forest, he can eat in the field or he can eat something different, maybe a carcass or... Uh, for the polar bear, it's quite different. Is from thousand years, he was alone in the north. No humans. The, the humans arrived very, very late in the north. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was uh, the boss for uh, <laughs> for maybe uh, six hundred years, six hundred thousand years. Uh, so he, he was alone, very far in the north. No human, and the human arrived maybe uh, thirty thousand years ago. So yeah, it's quite different. But some species. Are close to uh, to disappear, huh? and it's yeah. why it's important to speak about polar bears and brown bears. But for example, the the, the sun bears, the, so the small one who live in Malaysia, it's uh, very very it's very hard for these species because they destroy all the forest, um, and it's uh, maybe the species you know can disappear quite fast. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think that's a problem with a lot of species in in that part of the world, in particular. Um, yeah. uh, any any lar just because they don't have the room, they don't have the habitat. Um, there's a lot yeah, of habitat that's right. destruction. Um, that's the same thing. That's the same thing for the spectacle bear in the in Peru or in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems it's quite bitter now because they they, they create the corridors in different parts of the forest in the uh, the end. Uh, so now they can move. And if you have a, on a small patch of forest with some bears, 
it's impossible to live for many years. But yeah. if we create corridors between the different patches, uh, so that will be easier for the population to move. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you, do you think in general that, you know, the, the future for bears looks good that, I mean, they, they really, you know, especially brown bears do require a lot of territory. So in those, you know, do you think that they can continue to exist alongside humans if our population continues to grow and, and we sort of spread out into to more and more um, habitat that they've previously uh, occupied? No, I think, you know, it's at the subject of my next book. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm covering yeah, all your because, books here. I'm, I'm asking yeah, about... <laughs> thank you, Eric, for the question. And yeah, because, uh, you know, I think we are just, you know, at the, at the passage, you know, at the crossroad. Uh, you have to think, you have to... If we uh, agree to, to live with the bears, with the big animals like that, or it's finished for them. You know, we are just at the crossroad. For example, 30 years ago in France, there were only eight brown bears. Yeah. Only eight. Now we have 60. So that means it's possible. Yeah. You know, it's just a political choice uh, to say, okay, we, are, we need this type of animals living in our mountain. So that means our mountain are in very good health and the biodiversity is good. And um, so it's really a, a political choice. And of course, if it's a political choice, it's also a citizen choice. I just, uh, you know, I know that... If uh, you vote, when you vote, you vote for bears or not. You can see <laughs> that for, the, for you, the American. Uh, in the northern Alaska, it was possible during uh, the Trump uh, time, it was possible to go for very far in the north, uh, use the harvest the, the oil in the north Alaska, in the middle of the polar bear den, and now it's uh, finished. Uh, you, you see, it's really a citizen choice to say, we yeah. need uh, to live with this type of animal. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, oh, hunting seems like an obvious one where it's like, okay, let's just not do that because that's that's a terrible, that's a terrible idea, right? Like, um, uh -huh. you know, the, these animals already have pr a lot of pressure on them from habitat destruction and pollution and uh, who knows what else. So let's let's not let's not purposely go into their en environment and kill them. Um, I wonder though about um, so like where I live, uh, where I live in New York City. Uh, you think, oh, New York City, that's, you know, there's not going to be a lot of wildlife. There's going to be rats and cockroaches and that's about it. But actually, um, there's a lot. I mean, we have raccoons and uh, peregrine falcons and red-tailed hawks and, you know, coyotes that even that come into the city. And then when you get into the suburbs, you have, uh, you see, have a lot of deer and coyotes and, you know, and even bears, uh, you you can go an hour outside of New York City, and and there's a ton of black bears. And every time there's a, a black bear, you know, that comes into a town or something, everybody just ha everyone freaks out. They just they just it makes the news, and you know, the world's gonna end because there's a black bear in the town. And I mean, do do you think that we can really coexist with these creatures, uh, these big creatures? Um, if if we're continuing to to build into wild areas you know it's there are different problem we, we see you, you're doing uh, at the beginning of the covid in uh, in china we think it was really because you a lot of people uh, use too much animals from the forest and uh, uh, live too close to the forest and uh, and of course um, for example yes a small example very interesting i think in Africa, sometimes you have a problem with the uh, Ebola uh, virus and uh, coming from uh, bats and right. uh, because some people uh, eat some bats. But when you have the problem and the virus go to some a small family or a small village far away in the, in the forest, they die. Okay, because they, they receive the virus and in the small family they die. But if the family eats one million of people, and if some people eat bats, for example, or other uh, uh, people, uh, some animals uh, with virus, of course, it's a big problem. And now I think it's, of course, it's quite different with black bears. 
because in Northern America and in Canada, for example, in Vancouver Island and in this part, you have many, many bears around and very, very, like every day, you have black bears in town. But of course, you have to change uh, your life. You have to stay very quiet when you see a bear. You uh, don't put uh, uh, food in the garbage. Um, of course, you have to think we are not alone. We, we have to live with these animals around. And it's very really interesting to see a, uh, a deer crossing the, the street. And uh, why not a black bear? And in some place, it's easy to see black bears. And some years ago, I, I made a movie in Japan. And you have black bears, uh, Asiatic black bears, at two hours from Tokyo, um, coming in town. And so they use uh, some repellent noise and uh, some uh, uh, flares, and they try to, to live with, with bears. And it's possible. Yeah. Uh, so it's, you know, it's like a... You have to understand if you want to see uh, animals around the town. Sometimes they come in town, and they, of course they are very they are attracted by uh, food. And in Churchill, the small village with uh, like 700 people, in autumn you have 300 polar bears around the town. Wow! Okay, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> but during the night, when the town is very quiet, nobody go outside except the foreigners. <laughs> um, because all the people who live in Churchill, they say, that's the polar bear time, mm -hmm. and we have to, we have the time during the light, uh, we're doing uh, maybe from 6 o'clock to uh, uh, 10 p.m. After that, the polar bear time, they can cross the street. You know, it's, you know, and it's not a very big problem. Uh, and it's very, very unusual to have an accident in Churchill, maybe every 10 years. Yeah. Uh, so, and uh, uh, of course, uh, the kids, when they are going to the school, uh, they learn how they have to, to, to move if they see a bear on the, in the street. They put, the, you know, every, something uh, very fine the, or some, something on the head to protect the head. And uh, they stay very quiet and the bear can move and the, the kids can go to the street and to the school. It's not a problem. You know, we have to educate the people to live. With, uh, with this type of fauna. Yeah. Because now a lot of people live too far, too mm -hmm. far from nature. And of course, as soon as we see a, a raccoon in town, uh, for example, <laughs> ah, or a fox. <laughs> um, so uh, to see a fox, I think some people are afraid to see a fox, but it's not a problem to see a fox. Right. Uh, or a coyote, or it's not a problem, or a wolf. Uh, uh, I remember some years ago we were in the northern Canada and it was possible to see wolf at uh, one meter from us. Uh, we were in the sleeping bag with the wolf uh, uh, <laughs> maybe at one meter or two meters. It's wow. not a problem. Yeah. Um, so we have to, to learn to spend a lot of time in the nature and to learn with, to live with the yeah. nature. Yeah, and and like you said, it sounds like it's a, a willingness to uh, to change our behavior to accommodate these animals. Uh, to sh to share the space with them, um, yeah. as, as unusual as that may 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 seem, um, but uh, yeah, that's that's a it's it's an interesting point. Uh, just to just to wrap up, um, so you you have this book uh, coming out on being a bear uh, that's in that's in English coming out the end of the month. Um, where else can people interact with you? Where can they find you? Are you on social media? Do you do you have a website? Where where can people yeah, track you down the, if they have the best, questions? Yeah, the best way is to use uh, Facebook. Okay. With my name and uh, uh, my website is on the way. Maybe uh, it will be ready in uh, beginning of April or something like that. Uh -huh. And um, because I have different activities, eh? uh, we are also a, a production company. And uh, we make movie and uh, drone, and uh, uh, we have a lot of different activities. So the best way is to use my uh, Facebook uh, address with my name. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. And we'll we'll put a link to that in the uh, description for the video as well, uh, yeah. and and the show notes of the podcast. So, anyways, thanks a lot, Remy. I, I really appreciate Thank it. You, Rick. Sorry for the connection problems, um, but I really enjoyed your book. I felt like I learned a ton reading it and um 
would recommend it to anybody that that likes to learn would like to learn more about bears so thank you okay thank you that's it for this episode as always if you learn something new be sure to smash the like and subscribe buttons also click that little bell icon to get notifications when new episodes go live and don't forget i'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode so please leave a comment or question below thanks for watching and i'll see you next time Mm -hmm.